Sure, sure, right. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome someone who many of you may or may not know, but you're going to get to know more about him today. He's probably one of the most well-known primatologist and biologist out there. Uh, his name is Dr. Franz De Waal. Now, he is also a Dutch slash American uh, biologist and primatologist known for his work and on the behavior, sorry, and social intelligence of primates. His first book, Chimpanzee Politics, which was published in 1982, believe it or not, compared the smoozing and scheming of chimpanzees involved in power struggles with that of human politicians. We're going to talk more about that later on. Uh, ever since, the wall has drawn parallels between primate and human behavior, which I think is really fascinating as well. From peacemaking and morality to culture, his scientific work has been published in hundreds of technical articles in journals such as Science, Nature, Scientific American, and Outlets, many, many more. He's got uh, quite a few books which you can go and check out, which I think are highly informative and and really get to different different uh, core concepts as well. He's got uh, The Age of Empathy, The bon- Bonobo, and The Atheist, which I think is a Pretty cool title, if you if you ask me. He's got Mama's Last Hug, and his latest book, which came out last year, is called Different, What Apes Can Teach Us About Gender. Dr. Franz de Waal, can I welcome you so much to the Storybox podcast today? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your no doubt very busy schedule. Uh, I was completely hooked and fascinated by two conversations that you have had in the past. Number one with Dr. Jordan Peterson, and the other one is escaping me, but I believe it's to do with it's a psychology podcast that you were on. Um, I think it's Barry Kaufman, Scott Barry Kaufman. Yeah, that one. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I'm fascinated with the research about why we we look at why we research primates to begin with. And and I wanted to ask you, my very first question for you is what got you interested in studying the behavior of primates? Oh, I, I'm an animal lover. I, I saw as a kid already, I had many animals. It, it was not specific primates. Uh, primates came up, came around sort of accidentally. Um, but the big advantage of primates is that the comparison with humans uh, is much easier than that. Although, you know, you have people like Ed Wilson who have studied ants and have made good comparisons with humans. So, um, but primates, we are primates. And so the comparison with primates is very easy. Uh, and I work on chimpanzees and bonobos, which are our closest relatives. So, so that's an obvious comparison. And I've always liked to make these comparisons. And I, I'm not sure if I would work with birds or with fish or whatever, I would be doing the same. But I like all sorts of animals. So primates basically means animal, right? Primates... We, we belong to the order of primates. Right. The primate order is divided in monkeys and apes. Monkeys is most of the species. It's like 200 species. Monkeys, are the, they have tails. They're more distant from us. And uh, apes are large primates without tails, uh, which makes us apes. We are basically apes. We never call ourselves apes because we are very sensitive. We, are very, we have big egos and we think we're different, but we are basically apes. So pretty much uh, as evolution has gone on, we used to call ourselves apes. Is that correct? Or we, when did we, you know, when we started stop calling ourselves apes? Uh, we've never called ourselves apes. Never. Linnaeus is the, Linnaeus is the one who came up with the word primates. Like we are the first. Primates are the first among the animals for him <laughs> and for many people still. Uh, and, and among the primates, we consider ourselves first, of course. Yeah. So why are apes and chimpanzees considered to be our closest relatives? Uh, that's based on, on anatomy and on DNA. Yep. So it used to be based purely on anatomy. So people looked at bones and teeth and, and, and clearly we are related to them. And that's Linnaeus knew that already 300 years ago. Um, but then in the 60s, the DNA evidence came and DNA is actually a much better measure. And, and they placed us much closer than we thought. We thought 
we were close to the apes, but not so close. But then the DNA said we are actually extremely similar. Whereas, you know, the two elephant species, you know, the African elephants and the Asian elephants and how they, they're actually quite different, those two. Um, they split about 7 million years ago. And that's exactly what we split from the chimpanzees. So, so we're as close to chimpanzees as the two elephant species are to each other, basically. So when we say we split, what do we know specifically what went on regarding the split? No, the, this happens all the time that species split. So horses split from zebras at some points, you know, it, it, all these related species at some point they split. Uh, so the, the and, and there were many more species that that have disappeared, of course. Yeah. Uh, also in our lineage, but for example, we had Neanderthals who are really close to us, much closer than the chimpanzee, and they have disappeared. Right. So that's that's fascinating to me. It was like my big question is why in the world would they decide to split in the first place? Like, and then I guess the other question would be following along with that is today. Why don't, I guess, why don't we split? Does that make sense? Why don't we split today? Whereas we used to... Well, you don't decide to split. It's natural selection that says that if you live in this environment, you have other needs. And as a result, if if some of our descendants are going to live in a very different environment, like let's say Mars or something, and they're going to change. And at some point they become a different species because they have different needs in that environment. So, so it's not a decision you make. It's more like is evolution drives these kind of divergences between species. So it's more an adaptation to the kind of environment that you find yourself situated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. So I'm also curious about, apes and, and bonobos and, and why you decided to, because there's, there's hundreds of species of ch ch apes and chimpanzees, and is that correct? There are hundreds of species of primates. primates there's, only five, there's only five species of apes, uh, and the five species are gorilla, chimpanzee, bonobo, human, and orangutan. Okay. That's the five apes that, that's the five apes that we have at the moment. They're called uh, hominids. And what are the differences between, say, a chimpanzee and a bonobo? Oh, they're, they're actually, even though they're very close to each other, they're, they're quite different because the chimpanzees are male dominated right. and the bonobos are female dominated. So, so we have two close relatives. And that's why for a gender discussion, it's really interesting. It's because people always assume that naturally the males are dominant, but uh, we have a very close relative, the bonobo, where the females are dominant. Now, the females are collectively dominant. They're not individually because the females are smaller than the males and also in the bonobo. Um, but collectively, they dominate the males. Why is it that the females dominate the males for bonobos? Um, the females have banded together. There's right. a high level of solidarity among them. And we think it's mostly to do with infanticide. And so infanticide is when, when males kill infants. And in many species, males do that. So in, in bears, in lions, in many primates, the males may kill infants. And, and the females, of course, for the females, that's not a good thing. And they disagree with that. And so what the bonobo females have done is they have banded together and they have become dominant. And there's there's no reports. There's no report of rape among bonobos and there's no report of infanticide. So so the females have taken over. So rape can still go on in apes and, well, for chimpanzees and bonobos? I would say of the primates, the most common rapists are human. Yeah. Human males rape rape a lot more than primate males. In the primates, uh, only in orangutans, rapes is fairly common, but in chimpanzees, and in chimpanzees, extremely rare, and in bonobos, it's totally absent. So, so people sometimes think that rape is a very animalistic behavior, uh, which maybe is a good way of putting it, but it's not typical of many of the primates. It's more typical of our species. It kind of brings up the the big question of informed consent. Like, can animals give consent? to one another versus, I know, uh, humans can, but we don't usually. Um, is that yeah. sort of yeah. the... 
It's a good question, but if you've ever seen if you've ever seen a female chimpanzee, for example, being approached by a male and she wasn't she doesn't want to mate with the male, but the male wants to mate with her, and and the male has many ways of making that very clear. Uh, it's very clear that that female can make uh, it absolutely obvious that she doesn't want. So she screams at him, she yells at him, she hits him, um, and it's clear that she doesn't want to mate. And 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 I've never seen I've. I've probably in my lifetime seen a, a thousand copulations among chimpanzees. I've never seen a male force a copulation. So, so uh, they get the signals and they they stop, basically. And for bonobos, how we've got sort of the female-dominated uh, space, is there sort of any kind of like for them, they want sex but the male doesn't want sex? Is there any form of consent there or no? Yeah, they they negotiate. Bonobos have a lot of sex in all combinations of individuals, not just male and female. Um, and they um, they give signals. And and if one of them doesn't want, I don't think it happens. I've never seen that uh, that they force themselves on others. Um, but bonobos are interesting because they I call them bisexual in the sense that it, it, there are many species, of course, that have homosexual behavior. Um, but in bonobos, I don't even make that distinction because they have sex with all combinations, uh, male, 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 female, 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 uh, with youngsters, um, sometimes more than two individuals. Uh, and so uh, bonobo sex is, is much more variable than in most species. But chimpanzees don't have the same combination or do they? Chimpanzees, you may have sex between females or between males. It happens sometimes. And, and, and in all species, I think there's sometimes individuals who are more homosexual than heterosexual. Um, so, so that happens in many species. So among the, the whole primate um, sphere, we're saying that homosexual tendencies are sort of a natural part of the, the I guess I'm forgetting yeah. the word here. Yeah, it's part of the, the whole race. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that they have a homosexual orientation because they're usually not exclusive. So the individuals have homosexual behavior. They show that. And sometimes some individuals show it more than others. So you could say that they are maybe more homosexual than heterosexual. Um, but exclusive orientation, exclusively heterosexual or exclusively homosexual, it's not typical, and, I, and I'm not sure that's typical of humans either. In, in humans, of course, there's a lot of discussion about that, and people sometimes assume that all humans also uh, have multiple orientations and that society forces us into saying we're this or we're that because we like to classify these things. Um, but uh, there are many species where homosexual behavior occurs, yeah. So what does, I guess, learning more about why apes and chimpanzees have a lot of sex, how does that help with learning more about human behavior as well? Well, it depends on why they have sex. So, so for example, bonobos, they have sex in order to resolve problems between them. Uh, and so it's a conflict resolution mechanism and they are they're actually much more peaceful than the chimpanzee. So for example, if you introduce food in captivity, if you give them food, instead of fighting over the food, they will first have sex and then they share the food. And in the wild, if they enter a big fruit tree uh, where there's a lot of food available, they will also have sex before they start plucking the fruit. So the, so in Bonobos, sexual behavior has multiple functions. It has, of course, also the function of having pleasure and reproducing and things like that. But um, conflict resolution is a very important one, more important than in many other species. Which species? And, and, and yep. if you... If you ask what humans can learn from that, I think humans do the same thing, of course, that uh, within couples or families that this also happens, of course. I mean, apes and chimpanzees, I, I think I've heard you say sometimes they have sex over 50-something times a day, whatever it is. Is that the chimpanzees? 50 times a day. That probably um, might not have been you. It might have been Richard Rangham who said that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think it's a possibility for males, for females definitely. Uh, uh, if if you if you talk about heterosexual sex, um, in bonobos there's there's 
there's a lot more sexual activity um, between females than in most other species. And that is because the females have a, a sisterhood. As I said, they are dominant over the males collectively. And so the, for the females, that's also a political instrument, is that they, they need to maintain their relationships, and that's what they do. What is the politics of apes versus, well, not apes, but uh, bonobos versus chimpanzees? Yeah, so since in bonobos the females are dominant, um, the males are very dependent on the females in the sense that sons owe their rank in the hierarchy to their mothers. If they have a high-ranking mother, they will be high-ranking. If they are a low-ranking mother, they will be low-ranking. The politics in chimpanzees is very different because in chimpanzees it's basically a male business. The females do play a role, especially in captivity. Um, uh, for example, you, you're in Australia. You're at, are you in Sydney at the, where you have the? Is it the Taronga Zoo? Is is that what you yeah, have there? Taronga Zoo is in Sydney, and then we have Australia Zoo. Yeah, in yeah. Land. yeah. You have a beautiful chimp colony there, and in captivity, uh, in the chimpanzee, females have a lot of influence on the processes among the males. In the wild, the chimpanzees disperse over the forest. And the females have less to do. They just stay out of these things uh, most of the time because it's um, it's sometimes a dangerous activity to get involved in the fights among males. And, but the, the males have coalitions. And so uh, a male becomes dominant not because he's the biggest and the strongest necessarily. He becomes dominant because he has the best friends. And, and that's why it's a political process. He, he needs to have friends who support him and then when he becomes the alpha male, he needs to share with them because if he doesn't, then they withdraw their support. And so it's really a political process. And as a result, sometimes the smallest male can be the alpha male if he has good friends and female support. Uh, and so um, it's, it's really a, a process of political strategy and making friends and keeping friends and sharing food with them and sharing females with them, uh, whatever the male is doing uh, to stay on top there. Which one is more powerful, you reckon? The, the, one that ha the one that has the female political structure as the main source or the, the male? What do you mean? What, what, what do they have more? So, for, for example, which one has more dominance or more power? The bonobos with the female structure or the chimpanzees with the male structure? Well, that's hard to say. In, in the bonobo, it's, the power is in the hands of the females more than the males. And in chimpanzees, it's the opposite. Uh, the alpha female, being an alpha female is very different than being an alpha male. Uh, because for females, age is actually a positive factor. If, if they're older, they're more respected. And, and for example, in, in one big zoo colony that I worked with, we had an alpha female who was alpha female for 40 years. Hmm. Her name was Mama. And, and when she was 59, so that's when she died. At 59, she was mostly blind and she could barely walk anymore, but she was still the alpha female. That would never happen to a male. A, a male loses his position when he, he gets older and, and is physically not so fit anymore. And so the male hierarchy is contested. And, uh, and, and for example, in chimpanzees, the males are typically alpha male when they're between 20 and 30, when they're really uh, very strong at that point. In the females, age is a positive. Uh, and, and being older is actually a positive factor for females, which is not the case for males. So it's a very different uh, kind of structure that you see. Is that because for the females that are older, they hold a great deal more respect? Yeah, they, they are respected. And so in females, I think the dominance is mostly a, a matter of personality and age. And in males, uh, it, it's, it's a political structure where they need to get support and, and, and it's contested. Yeah. What sort of emotions would a, I guess, a, a more dominant female, the leader in the group, what sort of characteristics would they possess as in, in, as in emotions? I don't know. I've never figured out. Uh, I've never been able to predict if you see, uh, because we, we sometimes in captivity, we put females together uh, and males together. I've never able, been able to predict which female would, would be the alpha female. Uh, 
Huh. Uh, because, because it is also not ba- based on science, it, uh, it's, it's very hard to predict. And, and I think in humans, you would also probably find that very hard to predict. It is very interesting, I think, uh, knowing who's going to be the more dominant one. I mean, that's a study that I want to I want to see more of, <laughs> in all honesty. Yeah. 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 Fascinating stuff. But, and also, like, when you, the research that you've done, I guess, regarding um, female uh, bonobos and their kind of characteristics, do you find, what, what can we learn more about their ways of, of being empathetic towards others? And what does that actually mean? Yeah, empathy is found in both chimps and bonobos and is found in many, many mammals, of course. Um, empathy in its most simple definition is that you're sensitive to the emotions of others and you're affected by the emotions of others. Uh, and so if, if, for example, in humans, if you talk with a person who's crying, you're going to have a sad expression on your face. You may be, you may be crying too. Uh, or you talk with someone who's laughing and, and happy, you're going to be looking uh, happy too. And, and so that's, it's called emotional contagion. And that's very typical of our species, but it's very typical. People do now studies in rodents, rats and mice uh, on empathy. Uh, and, and of course, the reason the dog is our best friend is because the dog is empathic and sympathizes with our feelings and all of that. So uh, that kind of empathy at the emotional level is found in, in many, many mammals. And uh, I think of the apes, the bonobo is probably the most empathic of, of the bunch, uh, but you find it in all the apes. They're all sensitive to the emotions and the situation of somebody else. And the typical expression is what we call consolation, is that if someone is distressed because they have lost a fight or they have been beaten up or they have fallen out of a tree or whatever the reason is if someone is distressed then others will come over and embrace them and touch them and kiss them and try to calm them down and, and that is something that is actually also studied in dogs now people do studies on dogs in families and they they act as if they're distressed so so an adult in the family starts to cry and then see how the dog responds and the dog will approach and, and put his head in your lap or lick your face or whatever. So, so the, the dogs have very strong uh, consolation responses too. Does that come naturally to animals? Yeah, the, I say all the mammals have that. It, it starts with maternal care. So yeah. that's what we, we think is the origin, is that uh, an, an elephant mother or um, a mouse mother, she needs to pay attention to her offspring. And, and be sensitive to their uh, situation. And, and that's also why empathy is more female than male, is, is stronger developed in females than males, usually. And why oxytocin, which is a, a bonding hormone for, for uh, females. So, so um, we think that's where it got started, but if, obviously uh, it's not limited to the f- females. Males also have empathy. Some males, at least. <laughs> so uh, it's not limited. It's not limited to females. Have you learned or studied more about what happens when there is no empathy regarding people? Yeah, uh, human, humans can shut off empathy, especially for strangers, especially for individuals who are different from them. Yeah. Uh, and so empathy is very narrow, actually. Empathy is intended, and that's why it evolved, to take care of your family and your friends. It's, it's did not evolve to take care of other species or to take care of people who are very distant. Uh, and so it evolved for a narrow, narrow bunch of um, characters. And um, that, that also is the, the negative side of empathy. We, have, we don't have a lot of empathy for people who are very different from us. And, and so that's a challenge actually for us in this modern world where we live in big societies with lots of different people uh, to have empathy for others. Can we still have empathy even though we say disagree or we don't like someone else? Or is it more of a struggle? Uh, it's more of a struggle, but I think we can we can manage that. And, and of course, all the religions urge us to be like that, is they, to, be, to have more empathy for others. Yeah. But if you have groups who are very, real enemies, let's say the Israelis and the Palestinians, for example, um, 
that's a challenge to, to create empathy between them. And the only way to do that, I think, is by humanizing each other. For example, creating situations where they meet each other, where they have to play together on a team, for example, um, if you do that. And that's why in Europe, very often it's said, uh, because soccer is such an international sport. And um, we, we, have, we have players of all, all corners of the world and all races put together on teams and applauding them when they win and, of course, not being happy when they lose. But um, that's why they say that sport is so important because sport is a, a place where we integrate people from very different places. We try to integrate them and, and sport plays a very important factor in humanizing uh, the other, so to speak. Uh, so so I, I, I really believe in that. And, and that, that same role we see here in the U.S., where sports is also, uh, of course, like let's say football and so on, American football uh, is also a place that integrates a lot of different people. Yeah, trying to find a sense of commonality, common ground, right? Yeah. Along yeah. with being somewhat empathetic to other people's beliefs and because we're all different at, at, at the core, which is part of humanity, part of life, and we've got to learn somehow to get along with each other, even though there is difference there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, it's very important to create these situations where we see that the other is just as human as we are, and 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 that's because otherwise it's sometimes hard to see for people. Yeah, is it different? You think humans sort of trying to resolve conflict with empathy versus say chimps and bonobos, or is it sort of a similar structure? You think? Yeah, I've, I've done a lot of research on, on reconciliation in the primates. Uh, so, so they reconcile after fights. After fights, they come together and they kiss and embrace. In the bonobos, there's usually sex involved when they do that. Yeah. And um, reconciliation is most typical between individuals who need each other, one way or another, either, the, either because they're family or because they are good friends and they help each other on, on occasion. So, so um, reconciliation also has that same drawback of empathy is that it's mostly directed at individuals that you like and work with and 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 spend time with and and, and help each other uh, and, and so reconciliation with your enemies who, who you don't perceive as um, helpful for you uh, is more difficult yeah. and 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 we humans we live in a very complex world at the moment and so um, uh, in in our societies this is sometimes very really hard to achieve. And, and of course, in a society of chimpanzees or bonobos, they are much more small scale. They, they live in, in groups of maybe 100 individuals maximum. So they know everybody individually. There are no strangers for them in the group. There are strangers outside of the group. They don't care about those. They care about their, their own group. Do you find that fighting is, is actually a good thing amongst chimpanzees in conflict resolution? Uh, fighting? Um, I think fighting may be a good thing if if it's not violent. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm from a family of six boys, and so I, I know a little bit about <laughs> about fighting. Yeah. Uh, but we, we we never used weapons on each other. I can tell you, and so uh, I think as as long as you're not injuring each other, I, I I don't think fighting is bad. I have nothing against it, uh, because you need to make clear where you stand and what your position is, and so on. Um, and and I think that's what chimpanzees and bonobos do too, uh, but sometimes it gets violent, and I don't see a, I don't see a positive side to the violent fighting. You know. Yeah, I come from. Uh, I got two brothers, one older and one younger, and it'll always be mm -hmm. me and my older brother fighting. But it would be funny because my mom hated us fighting. It, it wouldn't be dangerous or anything, but mom would always tell my dad to tell us to stop fighting, or she'd tell us to stop fighting. And we often would get in trouble <laughs> for, for doing that. So, yeah, it, it is, um, yeah. even though we liked it, like I think for, for guys, it's in, within our nature to somehow fight with one another, even though it's play fighting. Like you're not trying to kill the other person. At least I wasn't trying yeah. to. I don't know about my older brother. I'm just, just kidding there. Uh, but yeah. No, was, no, no, no. So, no. So you have two kinds of fighting. Yeah. Yeah. You have real fights between brothers where you, you really try to beat up on each other. Uh, and, and yeah, th there's of course a limit to how much fighting you, you can tolerate in a family like that. Yeah. 
And then there's play fighting. There, there, there's just a wrestling type, you know? And, and that's something that primate males do all the time. So, so um, in all the primates that I know, the males do more of that mock fighting than the females. In all human studies that I know, boys do more of it than girls. And, and, and it's one of the reasons that boys and girls usually don't play together is that uh, because there's there's many studies on the segregation of play. Boys play with boys, girls play with girls. And that's partly because the girls don't want to get involved in these uh, stupid fights that, that, that the boys set up. And um, and that's mock fighting. And, and I'm a bit upset with by the American society because I hear that uh, at schools nowadays, yeah. school, some schools have what they call a no-touch policy. They have a policy that kids cannot touch and wrestle and things like that. And I think it's it's harmful because I think boys need to do that. Uh, the reason that young males need to have these wrestle fights is partly because they need to learn fighting techniques. And, and so that's that's one thing. But also they need to learn to win. They need to learn how to lose. They need to inhibit themselves. They need to learn when it becomes too much. Yeah. When they have a partner who is weaker, for example, if if yeah, they see the same thing with dogs, if a big dog plays with a small dog, he needs to inhibit himself. He, he can bite the small dog in two. So he needs to they have the inhibitions. And uh, you don't want men in a society, I think, who have never learned these inhibitions. So, so I, I don't agree with that kind of policy that people have. And in the primates, it's very clear. Um, for example, a, a male gorilla, if you, if you ever look at a male gorilla, you can see how strong he, he is. He, he is so strong that with his hand on a baby gorilla, he can do this and the baby is dead. Oh. And, um, but, but he, he plays with the babies and, and, and they survive because he has learned all these inhibitions and he has learned, learned them over his lifetime by playing. And so it's very important, I think, um, that, that boys learn how to control their bodies under these circumstances. Yeah, it's kind of like the American society, especially here in Australia as well, they're sort of emasculating men by taking mm -hmm. away their ability to be men. Rough and, rough and tumble play is part of being a man. I did it when I was growing mm -hmm. up. It was totally fine. And I turned out all right. You know, you, I'm, I'm a gentle gentle soul but when it comes down to it i will if i need to i will protect that is part of being a male mm -hmm. but it's like these days men aren't allowed to be men they're, mm -hmm. they're supposed to be more feminine and they, they tell them you need to attach yourself more to the weaker side of, of humanity because violence is wrong violence is is evil even though it is actually in some cases very good for a man to engage in those kind of activities for their own psychological state mm -hmm. of being a, a male and growing into one. And also like in, in playgrounds these days, I don't know if you've heard what they're doing with playgrounds. It's like they're creating these extra safe environments for kids. So that if they fall over in a playground, they don't hurt themselves. Like when, when yeah, I was yeah, a kid, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My goodness, I would I would fall over, I would scratch myself to Billio, I would I would come home like a, a wounded soldier <laughs> and it would mm -hmm. be totally fine. You get over it. Yeah. You learn you learn to get back up after you get knocked down. But that whole rhetoric is is now changing to if you get knocked down, no. Well you're not you're not even Yeah, I've, I, yeah I've, I've I've seen it. I've seen that they have monkey bars uh for kids to climb in and then they have a soft surface underneath uh but i think a kid need, needs to learn that if you fall uh, you're going to hurt yourself and so uh, that will teach you not to fall like that so <laughs> so yeah kids need to learn these things but um uh yeah the, the wrestling part you know it's so much part of of male primates and they do that all the time uh that i think it's uh, very important for them yeah do you think that it is a good thing for males in society, in society to exert their dominance with fighting to some degree? Between each other, you mean? Between each other? Uh, yeah, well, well, you hope that they get over that. Like, you don't want adult men uh, in the street starting up. You know, that happens, of course, that, that people yeah. don't control their emotions and they start fighting over nothing. 
Uh, but but I hope we can do these things verbally. Uh, <laughs> the, more yeah, more, uh, uh, more road rage, Franz. <laughs> There's so yeah. many people that uh, get into a heated fisticuff. So, so, even, so yeah, even though I'm, I have no trouble with, with boys uh, mock fighting, I must say as soon as it gets violent uh, and, and, and if weapons get involved, I'm not a big fan of that. And I think uh, men should should learn to control these emotions. We see in chimpanzees uh, the males being the more dominant side of things. Do they exert their dominance by obviously being the more tougher male, the the one that can beat the other one? That is sometimes the case, but but as I said, it's it's also a political process where they yeah. they need to have supporters. It's not just your individual abilities that um, dictate that, and 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 also. Um, you know, the high ranking males, you have sort of two types. You have the bullies who um, beat up on others and, and terrorize others. And they do exist. Uh, I would say maybe one in five males is like that. Um, but you also have uh, responsible leadership. Yeah. And so you have alpha males who who break up fights between others and they protect others and they protect the underdog. They protect the young against the old and the females against the males. And, and they can become extremely popular if they're good at it because they, they produce peace in the group. And so, um, most of the alpha males I've known are responsible leaders who, who have a constructive role in the group and, and they can be very much loved by the group. How do they go about fixing bullies? Politically, so um, the typical role of alpha males is is when there's a fight going on, they step in and they step between the parties, oh. and and males can do that better than females because the males are more imposing and bigger, and so they step between them, and they and they stay there till the fight stops, and sometimes they beat up on the on the aggressor. So if let's say a male attacks a, a female, they may chase off that male. Um, they, the, the role of alpha females is also interesting because high ranking females, what they do, they cannot step into a fight like that easily, but they fix the problems afterwards. So when the two parties have had their fight and they, let's say they're not reconciling, uh, an, an older female will walk up to them and bring them together and, and literally take one by the arm and move that one to the other so that they sit together and they groom each other. And so uh, females step in usually afterwards and fix the problems then, and males have a tendency to step in while the action is going on. Do they have family structures at all? No, the, the males are not involved in offspring care at all. The, the males may protect a female and may protect a youngster, but um, they're not caring for them. They're not carrying them and not feeding them, no nothing. Uh, even though they have a capacity for that. So there's interesting observations in the field when, for example, a mother loses her life and all of a sudden you have an orphan. Mm -hmm. um, some, sometimes uh, a male may pick up the orphan and adopt it, not just for a few days, but for a few years and carry it around and adopt the youngster, uh, which shows that they have a capacity to do that and they have a tendency to do that. Uh, and so uh, I always bring that up because in modern society, we ask men to be more involved in the families, and yeah. many of them are. And sometimes people say that's not natural because that's a women's job. But actually, uh, in the primates, even in primates where the males usually do nothing, they have that capacity to do it. It's interesting. It is very interesting because, yeah, in, in human primates, the male is necessary for raising, mm -hmm. especially men, right? Raising men to be men or boys to be men. Mm -hmm. So it's fascinating how chimps, is it the same thing with, with, with bonobos and, and apes, right? They don't, they're not involved. I mean, the, you yeah, so, the so, so, so you say, so you say men are necessary to raise men. Well, that's something that comes in and I think in adolescence maybe, uh, yeah. but, but I'm talking about the care for really young individuals. And of course, in the, in the early stages, uh, males cannot, in the primates, males cannot take care of a baby who is still nursing. That's, 
that's not a possibility for them. Yeah. But uh, as soon as the, the the babies can eat solid food, which is after a couple of years, when they can eat solid food, a male can be a good t- caretaker. And um, teaching teaching boys how to be men, yeah, that comes in, but that comes in much later. That comes in in adolescence or something like that. Yeah. So what is what are some of the things that chimpanzees will teach an adolescent uh, chimp? Oh, it's very important that um, young males grow up as adult males uh, because they become very unruly if there's not an adult male around, and yeah. uh, and they become they become dangerous to females and and dangerous to youngsters. Uh, the most striking story on that is elephants. You know, in elephants, many of the big males have been hunted for ivory yeah. because they have the biggest tusks, and so in some parts of Africa. All the big male elephants have all the the bulls. The big bulls have disappeared, and uh, in some of the parks, they had a lot of trouble because the younger males, the adolescent males, who are already very big, they became very dangerous to the females and became very dangerous to rhinoceroses, very dangerous to all sorts of wildlife, uh, because just for sport they would kill other animals. And so, some of these parks, uh, the solution was to bring in bulls. So they would bring in uh, five or six big bulls who were much bigger than these youngsters. And and all these males that these males needed to do was walk around. These big bulls would start walking around. And all of a sudden, the young males became, uh, they changed their behavior. They became much more docile. And and the same is true with chimpanzee uh, in captivity. If you have a group of of chimpanzees and, and and they don't have fully adult males, then, then you need to worry about the adolescent males because they, they become unruly and they become violent. And, and just the presence of, of, of adult men, and the same is true for human families, the fatherless families. I, I don't think the men need to do a lot. You just need to be there, and it already is, has an enormous impact. Even their presence, yeah, is yeah. super important. Like you see a lot of unruly kids running amok, because they, they might come from fatherless homes, you never know, but that's often the case that goes on, especially with America, uh, I've noticed, mm-hmm. and even here in Australia, it's becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, so men will um, be responsible for obviously giving life and then they won't be responsible for raising that life later on or yeah. even being part of it. So it is yeah. interesting how when you've got the dynamics between a fatherless child versus a someone that actually has a, a father in their life and you can tell the distinct differences but it also comes down to I think you, you see some people that, that do grow up without a father but they've got male figures in their life mm-hmm. like it's almost like you were saying that a male will adopt uh someone that has been like been yeah like- that's actually that's actually the, the, there's quite a few lesbian couples who, mm. who have children who make sure that they, they see some adult man, a responsible man, uh, like it can be teachers, coaches, uh, uncles, friends, um, so, so that in their life there are some men, which is important for both boys and girls. So, so for example, uh, there, there was a study, I think it was an Australian study or a New Zealand study on hormonal uh, changes. So if if children have no father, the girls menstruate earlier uh, in their uh, life um, oh, really? when there's no father present and 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 uh, and sometimes get pregnant more earlier than than other girls and uh, the boys become unruly and and get into trouble with the police more often if there's no father around or do drugs more often and so um that study indicated that um the presence of fathers is is beneficial and and, and sort of uh, slows down the development, actually, of adolescent kids. It slows them down a little bit. Yeah, yeah we've um, heard of women that have daddy issues, so to speak, when, mm-hmm. when the father wasn't actually really present or he might have been present, but he was absent from from mm-hmm. that. So there's a psychological damaging part to the development of, of the female, so they kind of end up resenting their dad and acting out, so to speak. Is that mm-hmm. sort of like the, mm-hmm. the study that you've witnessed yeah maybe maybe those were studies that came from your corner of the world but i don't know exactly uh, and um 
uh, because I, you know, I work more on the primates and in the primates, since you don't have a family structure, uh, so, so in chimpanzees and bonobos, we don't have male, female children. That's not the family structure they have. The females do all the work on, on the offspring, uh, and carry them. And that's why they have much fewer than human women can have. So, so, uh, for a chimpanzee, for example, they have a baby every six years. They cannot, they cannot handle more than that. And, mm-hmm. and, and the humans, of course, because of the different family structure, that's why we have overpopulation nowadays in the world is we are capable of producing a lot more kids uh, and, and and it has it has given us benefits that that family structure that we have but at the moment of course uh, it's leading to a lots of trouble in the world do you find with this may be somewhat of a controversial question so to speak do you find and I don't want to offend anyone by asking it but I'm more curious about the effects that same sex same sex couples have on the raising of say, if it's a lesbian couple raising a male, if it's a um, two and, and vice versa, you know what I mean? Like, is there any issues that you come across with that? You don't have to answer if you don't want to. I'm just curious. No, I, I, I'm not very, uh, you know, that's not my field of study, but um, I think there is no evidence from what I've seen in the, in the literature that um, these children grow up very differently. And, and, and as I said, uh, many of these couples, both gay gay man couples and lesbian couples, they try to bring in adults of the, the other sex in in the life of their children, yeah. one way or another, uh, an, an aunt or an uncle or something like that. So, so they do their best to diversify the adults that the kids see, so to speak. And and I, I've never heard that it's really a problem. Yeah, I was just curious. That's all. Um, I, I did want to ask you about your new book, Different, What Apes Can Teach Us mm-hmm. About Gender. So there's a whole debate going on about the, the huge transgender issue that's mm-hmm. happening in, in society. Do you find or do you see in in chimpanzees and bonobos there is such a thing as transgender? Well, I describe in my book that um, you sometimes have males for example, male chimpanzees, who are big and strong males, but they don't want to play the macho game. They don't want to be part of, uh, they, they stay out of male politics and they don't want to be the alpha male. And they they lead a different life than most males. And you have females. I describe a female chimpanzee named Donna, who from very young, uh, she was different from other females. And so when she was very young, it's only three years old or so, she would already like to wrestle with with adult males uh, with me, um, and she um, she grew into a, a more male like character when she was adolescent. And when she was adult, she looked like a male. She had all the long hair and the big shoulders and the big head of the males. She associated with males. She started to act like a male, and of course, I could not ask her identity. So I don't know what how she identifies, but but she looked like she could identify like a male. And so I personally think that the same gender diversity that we see in human society of homosexual individuals, heterosexual or uh, transgender or uh, cisgender, the same diversity that we see in human society, we can probably find in, in chimpanzees and bonobos. And, and the big difference with human society is that I've never seen that it causes trouble. So I've never seen that they are intolerant of it. So it, it, it doesn't matter to them. That's how that individual is, and they just accept it as it is. I think as long as these individuals are not overly aggressive, and they usually are not, so so as long as they don't disturb the peace, it's fine with them. What are the main distinctions between male and female, especially with chimpanzee uh, and bonobo culture? In, in chimpanzees, the same is true for bonobos, but in chimpanzees, the male is, is quite a bit bigger than the female. The size difference is, is about the same as in humans. Uh, and so the male has more hair. Actually, in humans also, you don't notice that, but we ha- the men have more <laughs> hair on their body than women. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they have more hair and they are bigger and, and their shoulders especially are bigger uh, and their necks are, are thicker. And uh, and and in in brothers and chimpanzees, in addition, the males have big canine teeth, 
which the females don't have. Uh, in humans, that has disappeared. That difference has disappeared. Yeah, right. Fascinating stuff. So mm-hmm. when we're talking about, say, the gender roles of humans versus what's happening with chimpanzees versus bonobos, I mean, how are they uniquely different as, as such as like with, with humans, we obviously we have the distinct characteristics of men have more hair. We're a little bit bigger. We've, we're able to do that, but society is now teaching that if a boy wants to be a woman, he can be a woman. And as such, like that's totally normal. It's totally fine. Let's, let's go about it and, 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 and do that. Do you find that there is any issue with that? Like if, if I want to be a female, I can try and, and transition? It's not so much that you want to be. I don't think it's a choice. These kids, the trans kids, yeah. it, it's not that they want to be a female. They, they feel that they are a female. or, or So, so they're bo- born as a boy. But after three years or four years, very early in life, they say, I'm a girl, and they want to dress up like a girl. Or they're born like a girl, and after four years, five years, they say, I'm a boy. I want to, I want to play soccer like the boys or whatever, whatever they say. And so uh, it's not so much a choice, and it comes in usually much earlier than adolescence, because people now focus very much on kids who are a bit confused sometimes about what their gender is and what they want to be and so on. But usually, uh, I think more than 90% of the, the transgender people, it starts very early in life and it's not reversible. So um, th- that makes you think it's a biological thing. It makes you think that uh, it's not something that that is induced by the culture. It's not something like a desire. And we've had that same discussion about homosexuality, you know, like 20 or 25 years ago, we had this discussion about is it, is it a choice? Yes or no? Can we reverse it? Yes or no? And we've now concluded, I think most of us in society have concluded that homosexuality is not something that is a choice. It's something that you either are or you are not. And I think with uh, transgender, that it's the same thing. It's a biological thing. It is your gender identity. And uh, yes, there may be kids who uh, during adolescence uh, all of a sudden start to express that kind of desires, but um, uh, I'm looking at more than 90% of the kids it starts very early. You know? Well, kids are very fluid, right? They constantly change their brain or change their mind on things on any given day. So to allow them to make a huge life-changing irreversible decision is something that society is now pushing on them, which I, I, no, I personally... No, I, I, I don't think so, because because it's still very dangerous and very problematic to be a transgender person. Uh, I don't think it's something that voluntarily you would choose to be if you knew all the consequences. So if you, if you look at... Um, there was a recent study in the US. They looked at kids uh, who had declared themselves transgender, who had... So let's say they're born as a boy and they say, I'm a girl. And they looked at them six years later and six years later, um, only uh, two and a half percent had changed their mind. So if a young kid of five years old, let's say, says that they are a different gender than they were born with, they don't change their mind. Basically, 98.5 percent of what is 97.5 percent of them they don't change their mind. So, so it is an irreversible thing, and it arrives very early. Uh, and, and it should not be confused with people who later in life uh, start saying these things. Uh, I, think, I think most transgender people, uh, it's something that um, that is not even a decision that they make. It's something that happens to them. Yeah. What age range are we talking about? The moment it sort of begins where they start thinking that they're not the ex- exact biological sex that they're born with? I think uh, more than 90% is before seven years old. Yeah. yeah. Seven years old. But, you know, again, uh, you're talking with a primatologist, and I, <laughs> uh, I, I know that literature a little bit, but um, in the primates, I see the same sort of gender diversity, and I see individuals who don't follow the rules of their gender 
and and it's maybe one in ten or one in twenty individuals who who are like that. It, it's certainly a minority. And um, what I find interesting is that we see that same sort of diversity, but we don't see the intolerance. So they, they don't worry about it. It's it's not something that they're concerned about. Well, it just raises the question of. Say, for example, chimpanzees and bonobos and gorillas and such is what happens when we don't follow with our gender roles or our gender consignment? Like what goes on with that? And mm-hmm. I think you've raised a few important points um, so so mm-hmm. far, which I think is just fascinating. And, and same when you, you look at humans as well, when we don't follow along with our biological sex or the the hormonal structure and we we want to or we think we're something different or, or whatever it's more like a psychological component mm-hmm. as well so i i just think it's it's really fascinating to be honest i don't know what, yeah so yeah um franz I, I really really enjoy this conversation i wanted to ask you two quick final questions if that's okay with you um uh-huh. I wanted to ask you about, so when chimpanzees, is it chimpanzees when they're in the wild and neighboring clans or groups come and take over? Is that chimpanzees or is it bonobos too or gorillas? No, ch- chimpanzees are like that. They are territorial. Uh, in, in bonobos, they mix between groups. The groups meet and they, they may mingle with the others uh, without aggression. But uh, in chimpanzees, um, there's always hostility. So it's mainly because of the territorial nature of yeah, them. They, yeah, yeah. they go and dominate and take over. It's, it's, it's a very yeah, violent they, process, they, isn't it? Yeah, they, they, they have some sympathies can be very violent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my final question for you, Franz, is there anything that you're currently researching that you're interested right now that uh, you want to share or you can, can you share? Is there anything that you... Uh, finding fascinating these days? Well, I, I remain interested in, in animal cognition and animal intelligence. And, and at the moment, there's all these interesting studies on insects and fish. And, you know, I, I work, of course, on one of the smartest animals on the planet. Uh, but um, there, there are all sorts of species now being studied, uh, the cognition of, and, and I find that fascinating, yeah. Well, Franz, it has been an absolute pleasure. I hope that you've enjoyed the conversation as much as I have. Uh, where can people find you and connect with you and learn more about your work? They can look me up on Facebook. I have a very big Facebook site, um, Franz De Waal public page, or they can read one of my books. And there's always books in the store, I suppose, or you can order them. Yeah. Do you have a, a personal favorite book or you love them all equally? I always like my last book the best, so that's a, that's a simple answer. <laughs> Your books are called yeah. Different, What Apes Can Teach Us About Gender, Mama's Last Hug, The Bonobo and the Atheist, and many more, which I don't don't think I asked you about that one, but maybe it's for another conversation. But, um, Franz, yeah. thank okay. you so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Your time, your wisdom, your advice, and for joining me on the Storybox podcast. Thank you.